my name is Mark and I'm a gamer. I, I may not look like one, but I am. Yeah. <laughs> that means that I'm passionate about the power of games and play, especially when it comes to resolving conflict. And I'd like to tell you about that. But before we do that, let's play a game. Please, oh, just like at mealtime in the airline, please look at the, the little table ahead of you and put it down. Uh, so it's flat in front of you. You should find on it a small envelope with the inscription, do not open. Please open that envelope. You should find inside a playing card that is red on one side and blue on the other. And attached to it is a small code word, your secret code word, which will help you to unlock value in this game if you figure out how to use it. Yeah? Has everyone found their card? All right. What I'd like to do now is ask the left side of the room, I'd like you to imagine with me that you are Team Donald Trump. Yeah? <laughs> imagine. <laughs> On the right side of the room, you are Team Kim Jong-un. <laughs> and for those of you in the middle, you decide which team you want to join. <laughs> Um, and we're going to play a negotiation game over the next few minutes, and you'll have five chances in that game to vote, and voting means pointing your card to the front. Um, voting red uh, is, is a move that is conciliatory, that is trustworthy, that invites the other side to cooperate. Voting blue is a move that's based on power and advantage over your opponent. It's sort of like summit dinners in Singapore versus nuclear testing over Guam. Yeah? Um, and now for a little math. The way this is going to work is we're going to play this in rounds. You are Tim Trump and Tim Kim, and you're each playing for the glory of your country. And your objective is to finish the game with a positive score. Yeah? Um, it works like this. I'm going to ask you in each round to vote by standing as best you can with the tables and pointing your card to the front. Uh, and I will make a judgment when I see that as to which color is dominant on each side. And my good colleague and friend, um, Bastian Franz, will take score and, and tell us where we are. Yeah? It works like this. If in any round both teams choose the color red, they will both gain one point. If in any round you both t choose the color blue, you will both lose one point. If in any round, if you, Team Trump, choose the color red and they choose the color blue, you will lose two points and they will gain two points. And the other way around, if you choose the color red and you choose the color blue, then you will lose two and you will gain two. And we'll play this five times and Bastian will tell us how we're doing. Are we ready? Okay, take a minute and think about your strategy. Set a strategy for yourself and for the team around you. Think about uh, what your objective is. Um, I'll give you a minute to uh, may perhaps confer with your neighbors, get to know the people around you, see if you can agree on a team strategy on what to play. At the end of my minute, I will sound this gong. And when I do, when I do, I will ask you to please stop talking immediately. Uh, stand and point your card to the front so we can take our vote. Are you ready? You have one minute. Go. Think and talk to your neighbors. Coming up on the vote, finish your discussions, and vote. I would say red on this side and red on this side, which is majority, from round one. Again, I will remind you, a vote for red is a vote for conciliation, trust, and cooperation. A vote for blue is a power vote, a vote designed to give you an advantage over your opponent. Yeah? We'll do round two in half the time, please. You've got 30 seconds. Again, you can discuss or just think, but see what you want to do this time. And coming up on the vote... And vote! Hmm, I would say red again and blue this time. Blue or red, red here, blue on that side. And we'll move into right three. We'll take this even faster, 20 seconds. This time since you all know the drill. And here we are, round three. Go! 20 seconds to set your strategy. That is now red and...
and blue. And we'd say. All right, we are, we are now more than halfway through. Shh. Take a moment, please, and look at the evolving situation up here. Reevaluate your strategy, see whether you want to make any changes. And this time I'm going to give you a little more time to confer, and actually you can confer with anyone in the room. We'll give you two minutes. Uh, if you can get to them in those two minutes, we can, you can even use the front and move around and leave your seat. But after the two minutes, we're going to vote for round four. And you can discuss with whoever you talk to, anything you like, anywhere in the room, absolutely no limitations. And we'll start. Two minutes. Coming up to vote. Vote! Blue on this side and blue on both sides, I would say. Blue, blue. And now finally, please, round five. We'll do in 10 seconds because you know the drill. Round five, 10 seconds to think. Lots of blue this time on this side, and here I would say it's more red. I'll call it red. <laughs> blue and red. <laughs> All right, the game is over. When I play this game in seminars in the real world, it takes about 90 minutes to prepare it, play it, and debrief it. We, today, we try to do it in five. You did a great job with that. Um, take a minute, though, um, just a couple of questions. Um, if you're happy with your result, raise your hand with your card, either color, just to show me that you like your result. You're happy. You succeeded. Looks like win-lose to me. <laughs> um, raise it again um, if you've seen a similar dynamic at work in your own conflicts, in your own life, in, with neighbors, with friends, with business associates. And now raise it once and point the color to the front of the room that reflects the color you think you normally play in conflicts in your life. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. This is the signature game of my small consulting and training company. I've played it all over the world. I've played it with Americans and with Chinese and with activists in Cairo and with children and diplomats and uh, participants in both Kiev and Moscow separately. Um, um, it's always fun. It's always fun. It's always different. It's always engaging. We usually put in real money to make it more exciting. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it is engaging and gets quite emotional and mostly it's deeply educational. It's a wonderful way to teach the d default behavior in negotiation. Um, but again, let's look, think again about your results. Um, what could you have done better? Um, how could you have had a better strategy? Um, how well did you communicate with people around you even given the restrictions of the room? Um, how do you feel about your relationship with the people around you? with your relationship with the people on the other side of the hall for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. When I play this game in longer seminars, we have at least three learning points. The first is the importance of trust and communication. Now, there wasn't much room for that here, given the intimidatingly large size of the audience, um, the configuration of the room, and the very extreme time pressure. But trust and communication are critical in negotiation. Um, secondly, at least under the kind of negotiation I try to do, we always want to make the pie bigger. We want to create value, uh, whether it's uh, financial or more, more creative, other kinds of value. And finally, there is this necessity to move a blue cycle um, wh where you're headed for wartime destruction, mutual destruction, and change it to a red one where you can get to a win-win result. And making that first move from blue to red is very difficult indeed. Email me if you want some tips on how to do that. But now I have a question for you about, uh, in thinking about making the pie bigger and communication and trust. How many of you thought to share your code word with someone from the other side when you had the two minutes to communicate? Anyone? Did anyone share their code word with anyone else? Okay, what was your code word on this side? Checkered. And your code word on this side was? Tablecloth. Checkered 
and tablecloth, checkered tablecloth, like in a locked room, escape room mystery. Put those together, what do you get? A checkered tablecloth. This could have been yours if you only trust and communicate. It's extra value. It is literally money left on the table. Um, and now for the bad news. <laughs> there are plenty of blue, blue cycles in the real world. Uh, despite the sober speeches in Paris a few months ago, commemorating the 100-year anniversary of the end of the First World War, with vows to never allow that to be repeated, um, the conflict industry is growing. Yeah. We now have 650 million refugees uh, fleeing war on all five continents. Um, the United Nations reports widespread famines in all four of their tracking categories. Uh, and triple wars have tripled, civil wars have tripled in the last 10 years. Um, the suffering continues, only now the suffering is mostly innocent civilians. Yeah. We see this conflict at all levels in our lives. Um, we see it personally with our friends, our neighbors, our husband, our wife, trying to resolve things personally. We see it at the national level with politicians that are forced to deal with each other, <laughs> even when they don't like each other. And then finally, because we don't communicate and we don't negotiate, we see it in the utter devastation of war. Yeah. It would seem that the, the human urge to fight is deep. It's very deep indeed all through history. And while our weapons may have changed, our appetite for using them has not. It would seem that the devastation of war is inevitable. It's part of human nature, despite what any of us might try to do about it. But here's the good news. Uh, neuroscientists have told us, and I can confirm from my own work, that there is another human need that is even deeper than this need to fight, and that is the urge to play. Uh, deep in the human psyche, even deeper than the need to fight, is a primeval need to play. A need that is found in almost every culture in some form and which lasts a lifetime. Yeah. Um, from the, uh, the infant counting her toes delightedly in the crib, uh, to the crowd cheering the World Cup final, um, to senior citizens playing bingo. Uh, we all need to play. I first encountered this need to play when teaching seminars to senior business people, not really obvious candidates for playful pedagogy, um, but I did my best with them. And, and what I found, without exception from all of them, is that when I turned the PowerPoint off and invited them to play, that the energy in the room increased. And more importantly, that the, the learning decreased, uh, or it got better. Um, play is, 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 is essential for all of us. I think my aha moment uh, a couple of years ago was when I gave a seminar uh, for a group of senior business executives in suits, uh, 12 of them, uh, and this was still using PowerPoint. And I, I like to think I'm a good speaker, I'm fairly clear, I'm fairly articulate, I'm able to communicate a complicated message in a, in a cogent way, but this time I was not successful. My audience did not respond. Um, the faces were blank and polite, but nothing more. Um, finally, after an hour, um, when we'd gotten through this and went to the coffee break, um, they all breathed a sigh of relief and all pulled out their phones, all 12 of them. Yeah. I looked over a couple of shoulders discreetly to see what was going on, and it was not email they were doing, it was not chat programs or Google, they were playing Angry Birds. <laughs> 12 serious suited businessmen playing games on phones. The evidence was overwhelming. And so in my work, I started to become ever more playful from doing cognitive games from game theory, like the one we just played this afternoon, to simulations, dance routines, um, a more complicated play with immersive and improvisational theater with actors smuggled into the crowd. Not today. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I went ever further with being playful in games, and what I encountered was an increasing uh, receptivity to this kind of play. People need to play. It's essential. It's part of our human nature. But how to link? Uh, no, and actually, before I say that, I play this especially with very senior, very serious people, with senior government officials in very grim places like, like China um, or Kazakhstan um, or Germany. <laughs> but how to link all of this playfulness with conflict? Um, that is the central question of my work and of my passion. Um, how do I harness this awesome ludic power that I see to do something meaningful about the conflict on this planet? And so I had an idea. In fact, I had three. 
The first was how to teach negotiation playfully. Why not use games to teach negotiation? Again, I'm talking cognitive games, I'm talking improvisational games, video games, apps, actors, anything fun. Secondly, why not set aside as large a portion as I can of the proceeds from that work to support projects that have found innovative ways to use play to resolve conflict? And finally, let's put an institutional framework under this, and so we established a foundation, Rational Games, um, which actually provides this kind of support to projects of this kind. We started bringing kids together in Africa to play soccer, kids from different tribes that, that, that were enemies so they could practice sports together. Um, we moved on to street theater in Afghanistan, um, to dance in inner city schools in the United States, to a film festival in Berlin um, with grants given now passing one million dollars. Um, and through it all, it was all about play. So let me tell you a little bit about a few of the lives that we touched along the way. In Berlin, we met two ladies from New York, theater directors with a passion for theater, um, who created a project called Theater for Tolerance, uh, which brought together school-age kids from Germany with school-age kids from Israel um, to get together for two weeks to write, rehearse, and perform an original play about tolerance. Um, we persuaded them to try the same thing, integrating school kids from Germany with four newly arrived Afghan refugee girls. The results were astonishing. In Egypt, we connected with a play centered on the Nile River, a uh, home of so much conflict for the nine countries that border the river, um, uh, especially when upstream dams create downstream flooding or downstream droughts. But the Nile is also the home to some beguiling dance music. And so this project found a group of musicians that got together, uh, that rehearsed a concert, got on a boat, went up and down the Nile giving concerts, the music truly brought the warring people together. And finally, I will never forget being taken to the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon, a uh, scene of so much horrific violence over so many years, to watch a group of Palestinian and Lebanese teenagers play a video game about conflict that we had helped to, uh, to, 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 to support. I watched these kids engaged in this game for two hours with their full attention, and then stayed on for another hour, still with their full attention, to have a discussion about conflict resolution. Uh, I couldn't help thinking about my 12 executives and their mobile phones, but this time we got the order right. And so I'm a social entrepreneur, and proud of it. I teach negotiation in a way that adds value, and I try to use that value to do something meaningful about conflict in the real world. If you like my idea, please join the game. Please, please play. Please give play a chance in your life. P try playing red. It makes for a much more p pleasant existence. If you like the idea and would like to know more about how to expand it in the nonprofit sphere, I'm happy to connect you with suitable partners. To say it with Friedrich Schiller, we are only truly human when we play. And also because I think dance is yet another kind of play and also an excellent metaphor for negotiation, I would say with the Red Queen from Alice, um, when she finally learned to be playful, I would say the invitation was, will you, won't you, will you, won't you, will you join the dance? I hope you will. Thank you. <laughs>